And Tyler today's message is on the board. What's your status? And this is more, in my mind, an alignment message. This is holding up the mirror in front of you so you can see where you are. Okay? And so be prepared to take this as an introspection. Yeah. Right? Because the Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Yeah. Now some versions don't have it translated that way, but that's okay. Most of them. And the point the point that is getting at is establishing other scriptures. The point that is getting at is your relationship with God. Your relationship in the world. And everything in your life is dependent on how you see yourself. It doesn't matter how much God loves you until you start to receive that love. It doesn't matter what God thinks of you until you start to think of yourself the way he did. Do you understand? Everything can be for you, but if you think everything is against you, yeah. mm -hmm. you can have everything going for you, your life can be better, but if you focus on that one little thing that you think is wrong, oh boy. Mm -hmm. come on somebody, yeah. 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 it will derail you, yeah. it will get you off track, yeah. right? Your mind is like a rudder, and if you move it just a little bit in the wrong direction, it will take you off your course. Yeah. Yeah. And the longer you stay going in that wrong direction, the further away from your purpose, from your happiness, from your blessedness, from your prosperity, from doing your part and your contribution in the world, you'll be. So you want to stay on course, and you stay on course by staying grateful. Yeah. Right? You stay on course by staying in front of God and his word so that you can be transformed into what he always meant for you to be. Y'all ready to go on now? <laughs> I'm joking. All right. What's your status? As normal, I like your participation. It slows us down a little bit, but I keep it in the service because I love it that you guys love to participate in the service. So can I get three volunteers on today? Praise God. I think you would be one. Thank you, Lord. I need one, two. Okay. Very good. First scripture is 2 Corinthians 5.17. All right. All right. Lauren's going to get that for us. Shelly's going to get Philippians 1 6. Marcy's going to get Ephesians 4 13. 2 Corinthians 5 17. Shelly, Philippians 1 6. Marcy, Ephesians 4 13. And I got one more, actually. Anybody else want to do it? We got, she did, I, I'll give you one too. How about that? Romans 12 2. And Hebrews 2 and 8. Hebrews 2 and 8. Hebrews 2 and 8. So we got a couple today. Yeah. Romans 12, 2 and 3. All right. Go ahead. Take it away. Okay. So 2 Corinthians 5 17. You want a microphone? Okay. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Amen. All right. Let's try that again with everybody listening. I heard some pages still rolling. Okay. Yeah, let's wait for everybody to be on one chord. This is really important. Everybody got it. 2 Corinthians 5 17. Everybody good? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you're in Christ, you can expect some new things. Yeah. All right. Who's next? Me. Philippians 1 6. That sounds right. That's fine. I love how sometimes, you know, when I go to these, I'm really highlighted. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. 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 Okay, Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 What God started, he's going to finish. Yes. Amen. He doesn't give up on That's right. Amen. Amen. All right, who's next? So I have Ephesians 4, 13. It says, Finally, brothers, until we all attain to the unity of faith, and 
of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Amen. So the goal for God is to build you up. He's using the fivefold ministry to build you up until you come to the full stature of Christ. In other words, God wants you to operate in the earth like Christ operates in earth. He wants you individually to know your purpose, your calling, and be as confident as Jesus was in what he was doing. He wants you to be just as confident in what you're doing. He wants you to rise into the unity of the faith until you believe in God. And believe in what God is doing in you. Just as much as Jesus. Mm -hmm. Alright, who's next? Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Woo! Amen. So, God is doing a work, but he's working with you to accomplish it. Yeah. Right? And you have to renew your mind. Mm -hmm. yes. You need to change how you think so yes. you can think like he thinks. Yes. So that y'all can get done what he's been trying to do in your life. Yes. All right, and the last one, Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews 2 8. King James Version. Thou hast put all things in, sub in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we will see, we see not yet all things put under him. Amen. So Christ is over all, but it doesn't look like it yet. I'm going to say that again. Christ is over all things. God has already put everything under his feet, but there's a delayed reaction. There's a period of time, just like when Congress enacts a law, there's a period of time before that law goes into effect. <coughs> Christ already won the victory, but it's a period of time before it all becomes apparent, mm -hmm. before we can see that he won the full victory. Yeah. We're starting to see it here and there, a little in your life here, a little in your life there, but you don't see the fullness of it just yet because God ain't through working on you yet. Amen. That's why us. Uh, 2 Corinthians, the one that Lauren read, she said, you're a new creature. It said, all things have become new. Now, if you look in your life, even when you get born again, you got excited about some things becoming new. But all things don't look new yet, do it. Just like Christ is already seated at the right hand of God and everything is already under his feet, but it don't look like it yet. Because there's some work in between. Those other scriptures tell you the work that has transpired in between. God has begun a work, but is not yet completed. And in order for us to see it, we've got to renew our minds so we can agree with what God is doing. Do you understand? This is how it works. I wish somebody would explain this to me 30 years ago. This is how it works. God has a plan. Oh, yeah. But you've got to agree with the plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then do what he tells you to do for the plan to come to pass. Right. Right. Come and until those things are all lined up, you won't see it. Mm -hmm. You won't see nothing new in your life until you renew your mind. Mm -hmm. When you renew your mind, then you begin to prove through your good decisions, through your good reactions, through your newfound self-image. What God's good, acceptable, and perfect will looks like. See, nobody knows what God's will looks like in your life until you start to live it. I'm going to say that again. Nobody knows what it looks like until you live it. And so it's imperative that you work on you and how you see you. If you see you as a loser, it don't matter how much God wants you to win. No. You will self-sabotage. Yeah. Yeah. God will set you up and put you on top of all your enemies, and then you'll find a way to work yourself right back down to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. God will bless you with opportunity uh, to bless you and prosper you, and you'll find a way to, to wiggle out of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. God will give you some new responsibilities in order to promote and exalt you, and you'll find a way to decline the responsibility. Mm -hmm. 
Am I telling the truth? Amen. Amen. God will open up a door and you'll find a way to close that door right back. <laughs> no, thank you, Jesus. Right? And he ain't going to force his blessings on you. But when he presents them, if you don't receive them, then nobody will ever see it in your life. Right. Title of today's message is, What's Your Status? You know, on applications, home loans, they have, on every home loan, they have a portion that asks about your status, your marital status. Are you single? Are you married? You know, and it, it asks that, and it's legal for it to ask. Even when you're applying for, for apartments in most states, they can ask if you're married, right? They want to know your status. Um, we were talking earlier about income tax. When you file your income tax, have you ever noticed they ask your status? Yeah. Are you filing single, mm -hmm. joint, and a household? What's your status? <coughs> Why they ask your status? Because your status determines what becomes available to you. Your status will determine what you qualify for and what kind of refund you get. Your status determines what you get out of it. And so does your status in Christ. Your status or how you see yourself in Christ will determine what you get out of your walk with Christ. The way you see yourself in Christ, your status, will determine whether or not you walk in the power of Christ mm -hmm. or whether you always see yourself as pitiful. Mm -hmm. Because at, even though the power is available, if you see yourself as pitiful, the power will never be utilized. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Even though God opened up opportunity, if you never seize the opportunity, no one will ever know that God even opened up the opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. Woo! Mm -hmm. It'll be undercover. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all got some undercover blessings. Mm -hmm. Because you have not availed yourself to the proper status. You still see yourself as pitiful. Mm -hmm. You still see yourself as that evil doer. Because you have not even, even though you say you receive God's forgiveness, you hadn't applied that forgiveness to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you still see yourself as your old self. And how can your old self walk in the power of God? Mm -hmm. You still see yourself as that liar, that cheat, that weakling, that this, that, that, and the other. And as long as you see yourself as that, God can never give you this. Amen. That's why when Peter realized who Jesus was, the first thing Jesus did was change his name. Yes. Right? Because in changing his name, he changed his status. Yes. Yes. Amen. You shall no longer be called Simon. But now you're going to be called Peter because now in my eyes, you're a rock. Amen. Yeah, your, your, your normal human nature might be unstable. You might have foot and mouth disease, Peter. You might jump ahead of yourself sometimes, but that's not how I see you. I know that's who you were, that's who you're prone to be, but that's not how I see you. I see you in a way that you've never seen yourself before. And if you can only, if you can only elevate your status in your own eyes, then I can do things that you've never seen in your life. Bible says, eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. It has not even entered into your thoughts and your mind what God wants to do in your life. You too busy dwelling on the past. You too busy focus on what the devil already did. You too busy worrying about all the mistakes that you made to see the blessings that's right before you. Amen. There are three statuses. On the, I got ready to print out income tax returns so you can see different statuses about the business and everything, but I think I'll just tell you for time's sake. There are three statuses in God that you have, these are not the stages of development. Those are separate. We talked about that in the leadership class. These are statuses, the way you see yourself. Not what stage of development you're at, but how you see yourself. See, you could be five years old and see yourself as a winner. Mm -hmm. huh? You could be five years old, like, like this, this, ten years old. How old is you? 10 years old and have confidence to stand up in front of people yeah. and tell them what you've been thinking about. Yeah. Is that right? Because your status 
has nothing to do with the stage that you're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you understand? Yes. How you see yourself has nothing to do with the stage that you're in. If you see yourself as a winner, you can be a winner at five or fifty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Huh? That's right. That's right. Amen. Caleb seen himself as strong. He told Joshua, he said, I'm as strong today as I was 40 years ago. Amen. Man was 80 years old saying, I'm as strong as I was when I was 40. Amen. Amen. Because in his status was one of strength. He seen himself as a strong person. There's three categories that I've discovered that, that people see themselves as. Slave, servant, and son. I'm going to back it up with some scriptures in that second. Slave, servant, and son. Now you got to figure out which one you are and do what's necessary to move on up to the next level if you ain't in sonship yet. All right? And I bet you, I bet you, you probably ain't in sonship yet. Because if you were at sonship, you'll be you'll be ruling over your situation instead of your situation ruling over you. Yes. If you was at sonship, you, I wouldn't have to encourage you so much to go after the promised land, mm. to go after what God put in your heart. Amen. If you was already at sonship, you understand? Yes. If you was at sonship, you already have the characteristics of your father, and you will already take ownership. Come on, somebody. You will already take ownership of everything that is your father's and what he's allotted to you as your portion. Amen. We'll get to that in just a minute. We're going to start with the slave. Okay. All right. The Bible says in Romans 8 15. Let's go to Romans, Carl. Romans 8 15 says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage. Again to fear. Amen. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Bible says that before you get saved, you are in bondage to the prince of this world. You are enslaved. That's why Jesus had to come and set the captives free. Yeah. Before you get saved, you are a slave to sin. Amen. You got to get help us. You want to do right, but you can't seem to get it right. And really, uh, before God even starts to draw you, you don't even want to do right half the time. Is that right? You really want to do the wrong that you're in, and then once you get in it, you think you got it, but it got you. You think you're in control, you turn around, and now you're in control. Is that right? That's how deceptive sin is. Sin will have you thinking, it'll entice you thinking, oh, look what you can have, not realizing it's thinking what it can have. Wow. Yeah. The Bible, the first mention of sin in the Bible is a personification of sin. Cain was thinking about hurting Abel. He was angry. And, and God told him, he said, sin is crouching at your door. It's right at your door and it's wanting to pounce on you like a tiger. It wants to leap on you. It wants to tear you apart in peace. It wants to have you as its prey. That's how you got to see sin in your life. Stop seeing the enticement of sin and start to see the enslavement of yes. sin. When you are in sin, before you get saved, before you get set free, you are a slave Amen. to sin. Satan. Then God comes and sets you free. Amen. Right? Yep. But here's the problem. Let's turn to uh, let's look a little further down just to verify this fact. It says, because the creature itself, verse 21, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So bondage, right? Bondage is something that God wants to deliver us from and take us to becoming sons of God, children of God, right? But now, once you get saved, once you get delivered from the bondage of Satan, if you're not careful, you will translate that same slave mentality into your Christian walk. Amen. Let's turn to Galatians. Galatians 5. <coughs> 
Galatians 5, 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And so what is he saying? He's saying if you're not careful as a Christian, you can take on a slave mentality again. If you're not careful as a Christian, you can be looking at your Christian relationship not as a son, but as a slave. Amen. Let me explain. A slave has the characteristics whereby they operate on fear. A lot of people, when they deal with God, instead of saying, I want to or I I, I can, they say, I better. <clears throat> because if I don't, God don't get me. Their whole relationship with God is one based on fear, and they're motivated by punishments. They're moved by reprimand. Well, I better go and apologize to this person, because if I don't apologize to this person, then God gonna keep me locked up. Well, I better hurry up and say I'm sorry. Because if I don't say I'm sorry, uh, God might have to chastise me. And Lord knows you don't want the father beating on you. <laughs> you can hear in the language that they have a slave mentality because they're motivated to do everything they do in God by fear. Amen. Well, child, you better hurry up and get that right. Because you know, uh, now that you, if you, if you go back, it'll be seven times worse. That's, a, that's one of their favorite scriptures. Because that seven times worse motivates them. Fear drives them. That's not the place for a child of God to operate. Fear is the opposite side of the spectrum from faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Fear is on the very other end. When you are fearing, you are misplacing your faith. You're placing more faith in what you're afraid of than what you than, than the God that has adopted you. You're placing more fear, you're placing more faith rather in the giants that's coming against you than the gods that's for you. Their whole meditation is, well, if I do this that God has urged me to do, this could happen. And that can happen. And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this person don't? And what if that person don't? And they're paralyzed. They're imprisoned. They're strapped up in a straitjacket and can't move for God because they're so afraid. When they do move for God, it's out of fear that God might punish them. Rather than out of faith that God might bless them. Mm -hmm. Listen to your talk. Listen to your thoughts. Pay attention to yourself and see, do I operate on faith? Because I believe God is for me. Or do I operate on fear? Because I'm scared God don't get me. You could be saved and still a slave. And if there's any area in your life, see, sometimes it's not across the board. But there's areas where you still operate in fear. There's areas where because you've been seized by the set sin, because you messed up after you got saved, now you're back in bondage in your mind and you won't even talk to God about it. Huh? You won't even bring it back up because you feel like, well, I done got saved and now I done went back to it. Now I can't take this back to God. Well, I done, I done got clean and now I done relapsed again. I ain't, I ain't going back to no other program. I done, I, done, I, done, I, done, I done stood up in front of the church and gave a good testimony and now I'm going to go get prayer and try to get this together again after I done messed up again. If you're thinking like that, you're a slave. You're operating on a slave mentality. And that's God never meant for you to be there. And just because you throw God into the conversation don't mean that you think you're right. I'm saying that again. Just because you say, well, I'm thinking about God, well, I'm using God, well, then God say, just because you throw God in it don't mean you're thinking about it right. One of the scariest things I ever experienced 
was when one of my children said, I said something that I didn't say. And I heard, I said, what, wait a minute, I didn't say that. And then I asked the brother and the sister, I said, did I say that? They said, no, you didn't say it like that. I said, well, don't misquote me. <laughs> you're, you're misrepresenting me when you misquote me. You're changing the whole spirit of what I was saying. Please don't put my name up in there with your messed up thoughts. Wow. If you're going to put me in there, say what I said the way I said it. Right. You see. Now God will chastise his children, but only to perfect them. It's all for your good. Yes. Everything he do towards you is everything come out of your father is good. He don't know nothing but good. He don't have nothing in his nature, but there's no evil in his nature. Amen. And so when he deal with you, he's always dealing with you from a position of one to bless you Amen. and do for your good. Yes. He's not like your natural father who may have abandoned you or, or your natural mother who may have fussed at you or beat you out of their anger. When he chastises you, it's always constructive. Because he's trying to conform you into something better. He only wants to bless you. Amen. And so the Bible says that where there is fear, this is in the letters of John in the back of your Bible, your love has not been perfected. And it's not your love that needs to be perfected. It's your reception of his love. If you're still operating on fear, it's because you don't really know your father. If you're still operating on fear, it's because you don't really know your father's heart. Mm. If you're still operating on fear, it's because you really don't know how your father want to bless you and how he operates in your life. You still see yourself as estranged from your father. He doesn't want to hurt you any more than he wants to hurt himself because now you are part of him. And so if you're operating on fear, understand that you're in bondage and you need to be free. If you're moved by reprimand, if that's the motivation, if you're, if you're paralyzed by what people say, and fear is your motivator, even in your Christian walk, even if you put God in it, it doesn't make it right. Because God don't want you to live there. He wants his love to be perfected in you. He wants you to receive so much love from him till you ain't afraid of anything. The Bible says that if God be for us, who could be against us? The Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Well, you might say, well, I'm not righteous because you're still focused on your sin. You're still focused on your downfall. You're still focused on that part that don't, don't want to line up with God. But the Bible says that you are no longer in you. But now you are in Christ. All things have passed away as far as God is concerned. He has removed from you. He has removed your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. When he see you, he don't see you. He see Christ. He see you standing in Christ and his righteousness. And until you receive that, you ain't really saved. I'm going to say that again. Until you receive that, you ain't really saved because there's a part of you that's still saved. The next level is servant. The status of servant in the Old Testament was the highest compliment you could give a man. Now, these men here say, I'm a man of God. I love that. I'm a man of God. I take that on, right? In the Old Testament, the highest title you can carry was he's a servant of God. Moses was called the servant of the Lord, right? And so servant isn't really bad. It just ain't best. I'm going to say that again. Servant isn't bad, it ain't best. Let me explain. Because whereas a slave is motivated by reprimand, they're trying to avoid punishment. A servant is moved by reward. They're moved by what they can get out of it. Now that's not all bad, but there's some gaps there for being all good. Do you hear me? 
A slave is moved by reprimand. A servant is moved by rewards. Too often the saints will ask themselves, when their vows of mercy are moved to help somebody, they'll stop and pause and say, what's in it for me? That's a servant mentality. You'll serve, but at a price. You'll serve, but you serve it to get to the pearly gates and to the streets of gold. You ain't serving because you love Jesus and you love what he's doing. You're more concerned about money than mission. Mm. You're more concerned about what's popular than caring about people. That's a servant mentality. Did you know that the Bible says that a child who is the rightful heir Okay, I'll read this in Galatians. It says the child, even though he's the rightful heir, as long as he operates in the status of a child, as long as he has the mentality of a child, right, mm -hmm. that he's no better than a servant. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I wrote that one down. Here it is, Galatians 4. It says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. You see, so a servant mentality and a child mentality is equivalent. You're not full grown yet when you only think only come to church to get your blessing. Why you come? I came to church to get my blessing. Well, what about everybody else in here who's hurt? Who ain't doing as well as you? You're only motivated by your blessing. The sister said so well. The, the miracles in other people's lives sometimes. Can you not get happy about that? Right. Or does it always have to come back to you? Huh? If everything always ha I hear it too often. I can't even get my blessing. Well, I got what I need, and then they out the door. I have to tell you, greet somebody you didn't come with. Get to know somebody, right? You ought to be looking for somebody to bless before you leave here. Because your blessing is incomplete as long as it stays with you. Right. See, God has a pipeline for blessing. And he looks for people that he can use as a pipeline. Right? He looks for people who can broker blessings. That's what Jacob's ladder was about. You have, you, have, you have a heaven open above your head. And when God sees that he can channel something through you in order to bless others, now he uses you to do that. And while he using you, you can't help but be blessed because there's a residue of the blessing stuck in you as it moves through you. Do you understand? This is God's plumbing system. <laughs> as the blessing moves through you, it leaves a residue. And so you're going to be blessed. You ain't got to focus on your blessing. God is going to take care of your business. Because you ain't working with him. Amen. Come on. 
You start working with him and you'll start to explain the minute stuff that's happening for me. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, stuff that you tried to make happen before that wouldn't right. happen. Right. Now it's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, somebody. I know yeah. Yeah. Now it's happening because you don't forget about you. Right. And you start to focus on what God wants and focus on blessing other folks. And next thing you know, all these blessings just overtaking you. While you're walking in his will, the blessings overtaking you. They're coming up behind you. They're walking you down. They're jumping on your back. You don't even know where they're coming from. All you know is you're doing God's will. And all these blessings are overtaking you. But that doesn't happen when you focus on you. That's right. That's right. That doesn't happen when you're only concerned about you. That's right. That's why when he taught us to pray, he said, Thy will be done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thy will. Our Father, which are in heaven. Yes. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And thy will be done. He said that before he got to tell you to ask for your daily bread. What is he doing there? He's prioritizing things for you. Yeah. Before you get to ask him about you, get right with him. Yeah. Yeah. Because in getting right with him, it lines up everything else right in your life. That's right. See, you might be asking for you and be asking amiss. Mm -hmm. Be asking the wrong thing because you ain't really asking in his name. Just because you add Jesus at the end of in Jesus' name, don't make it in his name. That's right. In his name means in his nature in accordance with his will. Now, if you start praying outside his will, you can add Jesus' name to it all you want. It don't make it his will. That's right. And so the first thing you want to do is find out what your good and heavenly father wants. Yes. That's right. Then ask for what you want. That's right. That's right. In line with what he wants. Right. That's right. Because how many of y'all know, most of y'all here don't live long enough to realize that what you think you want ain't always what you want. Sometimes you can get what you want and regret it. Sometimes you, you don't get what you want and you say, woo, you look back and you go to that high school when you in and you say, God, thank you for not giving me that. Surnames as a, as a sufficient call. They didn't have surnames. And even before they had surnames, they were, they were you know, Leonardo da Vinci. He was from the, the village of Vinci, right? Mm -hmm. And so they would use his, the, where he was from, right? But now in Bible times, in, in Jesus' time, they would say, You are the son of, right? So they would say, Simon Barjo, right? Uh, 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 uh. Then there were some other examples in the Bible. That, bar, that son of was significant. Because in their culture, the son is always identified with the father. Yes. And whatever characteristics that the son possessed, he got from the father. Mm -hmm. And whatever characteristics the father has, when the son is full grown, everybody expected the son to have the same characteristics. Yes. Matter of fact, the son was oftentimes the first apprentice to the father. And so if the father did good carpentry work, right, and they came to the son and the son was fully grown, then they expected the same quality of work from the son. Come on, somebody. Why? Because the son had been tutored. The son had been chiseled. The son had the father's hands on him long enough to receive the father's nature. Now, how many of y'all know that the Bible says that when you got saved, you got the opportunity to participate 
or to partake right. of the divine nature. Right. Right. When you got saved, you got with those things that became new. Well, one thing that became new was the fact that now you can be like God. Yeah. 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 Huh? But you can do it the right way. Yeah. There's a wrong way to be like God. Huh? The secret, crystals, tarot cards, new age. Yes. Huh? Confessions and confirmations that don't conform to the word of God. Come on, somebody. Huh? All that foolishness out there where you're trying to be your own God and you're casting spells. Don't even know you're casting spells. Huh? I just need to call it out because, you know, Christians participate in stuff that they don't even know what they're doing. And if you don't do it right, it ain't consecrated, it ain't sanctified, and the devil get in it instead of God. Right? And you can try to be like God your own way, Adam and Eve, instead of being like God, God's way, Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody, renewing your mind, being conformed to the image of Christ. Do you understand? And so you can try to counterfeit being like God, or you can come the right way. Matter of fact, the other day I was cleaning up a yard just yesterday. I left it there. Hundred dollar bill. Matter of fact, there was two stacked together. But I could look at it and tell that it had been printed. It was counterfeit. So I ain't paying much attention once I realized it wasn't the real deal. Right? And God don't pay you no attention when he realized you done came the wrong way. Wow. Jesus out the door. Wow. I'm the way. If you try to get to the Father some other way, you a thief. Huh? You ain't gonna get the kind of reception you think you're gonna get. You ain't gonna get the kind of results you think you're gonna get fooling with that other stuff. You got to come through me. Is that right? Yes. And whether you like it or not, there's one way to God. Through the man, Jesus Christ. He's the only propitiation for your sin. No other religion, no other way provides remission of sins. Because without the blood, Muhammad didn't die for you. Buddha did not die for you. Call somebody. Nobody else in none of these strange religions died for you. There was one Savior who gave his life. It wasn't the nails that hung him there, baby. Come on, somebody. It was his love for you that kept him hanging on that cross. Until he was saved, until he could know for sure that the work of salvation in your life was finished. Once he knew it was done, he gave up the door. He didn't take it from him. He said, you don't take it from
is us trying to bless us. It's us thinking that we can bless us better than God can bless us. And so we say, well, God, I know this is your way, but, you know, my situation is such that I might need to do something different. Right? And so we, 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 we excuse ourselves from the righteous requirements of God and we say, God, I think I know you gave me all the fruit of the garden, but I think it might be from this fruit. There's some kind of way my life might be better. Some kind of way I can make some improvements on what you've already done. And that's the essence of your sin. You don't think to yourself, I hate God. Yeah, yeah. I want to do wrong. I want to go serve the devil. That's what, what winds up happening. Jesus. But that ain't where you start. You just yeah. start thinking you're smarter than God. Yeah. God don't really know my situation. And maybe he don't care as much about me as I care about myself. So maybe I need to take care of this. Mess oh. around waiting on God. I might never have sex. Hallelujah. Waiting on God. I might never have no pleasure. Wait on God, I might not ever get an opportunity. Wait on God, I might not ever. I might not ever. I might not ever. What you are defaming your father's nature. Jesus. You're bringing down his good name. He ought to take you to court for life from behind. Sticking, thinking like that. <laughs> You sitting there telling yourself that some kind of way you love you more than God loves you. That you want more for you than God wants for you. And the devil is a liar. Yes, he is. You don't love you better than God loves you. You can't bless you better than God can bless you. You don't know better what, what better path to take for your life than God knows for you. That's why he told you in the book of Proverbs, lean not to your own understanding, little dumb sheep. <laughs> Trust the shepherd. He knows the way you ought to take. You keep transgressing, getting out the way, and he already laid a path of blessing for you. If you go down that path, you're going to accomplish every good work he, he purposed for your life. That he predestined for your life. He had you in mind before your mama and daddy was even here. He had you in mind before he started to shake the world. Look, somebody take a deep breath. God put that there for you. Before you got here. He provided the fabrics for your clothes before you got here. Because he wants you to be clothed right. Come on. Yes, right? He, already, he already put it in somebody's mind to start a business so you could have a job. God already knew what kind of, come on, y'all don't understand. God already knew. He knew what you needed before you needed it. I believe the scripture says much. Jesus said, Jesus, let's turn it there. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Yes. I think we're around verse 11 somewhere. I want to get there anyway. Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. He says, I ask him, it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. I'm going to start at verse 7. Chapter 7, verse 7. For everyone that asks to receive, and he that seek and find, and to him that knock and it shall be open. Oh, what man is you? Is there of you? Whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you, being like you are, you know you. You know you. But you know, even though you know you, that you still know how to be good to your children. You, then being evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? Somebody say, how much more? How much more? So whatever goodness you can be to yourself, how much more can God be to you? Amen. 
Ask yourself that. How much more? If I start doing it God's way, how much more? Woo. If I forsake my ways and forsake my negative bad attitude and start getting with what God got for me, how much more will I enjoy life? How much more of the abundant life can I have? How much more pleasure can I experience? How much more? How much more? Huh? How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Huh? He already know. And he want to do more. He want to bless you better than you want to bless yourself. But he has a way. Somebody say a way. A way. As a matter of fact, the first Christians weren't known as Christians. They were known as followers mm -hmm. of the way. Yeah, are you a follower of the way? Ooh. Or are you just calling yourself a Christian? <laughs> are, you, are you a follower of the way? Do you take the way that God say, or do you take Jesus. your own way? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Do you do the way God say do it, or do you just do it? I was reading the other day. My wife had a question about it. Nahab, Nadab, and Abihu was Aaron's sons. Yes. They had just got consecrated as priests, mm -hmm. and they went and offered what the Bible called strange fire to God. Mm -hmm. Something he hadn't asked for in a way he didn't ask for. Ooh. And the Bible says fire came out from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And consumed it. Now these boys had just got consecrated as two of the five priests of God that had ever been consecrated. These were the five chosen men. There was Aaron and his four sons. And two of them decided in their mind that they can go before God the way they want to. That they can do things that they, that they want to. That they can present anything to God that they want to present. And he just needs to bless it. Are you presenting stuff to God and expecting him to bless it even though he say that it's a mess? Oh. You lucky fire don't come out and consume yeah. That little pain, that little heartache you experienced, that little toe you stuck, that ain't nothing compared to what you should have got. That's right. That's right. Fire should have came out and consumed you for trying to offer up to God something in a way that he never asked for. When you know better. They dab in a Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do better. And gonna go before God and try to make him accept something. Mm -hmm. Try to shove something down God's throat. Try to shove something in God's face. Mm -hmm. Bless my mess anyhow, God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, huh? You're gonna try to make God bless something mm -hmm. that he said was wrong. Ooh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Shame on you. You lucky God don't consume you. Right. Mm -hmm. The very fact that you're here right now yeah. in the flesh yeah. is evidence of God's mercy yeah. in your life. Yeah. Trying to make you bless something yeah. that yeah. you said was unblessable. Yeah. Some things are unblessable. You can't bless it. You can't bless nothing God curses. If God says it's wrong, it's just wrong. There's no way to make it right. You just got to do it God's way. That's the only way to make it right. You can't do it your way and then hope that it turn out right. Hmm? That's insanity. Huh? That's insane. I'm going to do wrong by God, but I want God. And you got to think about God. Think about God for just a second. Sometimes we personalize God too much. Sometimes we don't personalize him enough. Other times we personalize him too much. We make God this little person that sits off way far off, who can only do so much. You're talking about the one who maintains, who maintains the spin of the earth so it doesn't go flying out into the cosmos. Who maintains the perfect temperature on earth, maintains the perfect tilt of the earth. Huh? Maintains a perfect distance from the sun so you don't burn up neither do your friends. Do you understand what I'm saying? Who controls the winds? The weatherman said it was going to blow this way and did it turn around and blow that way. Nobody can tell you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and God is in charge of all this 
for some kind of way you know better than <laughs> He laid the foundations of the earth, told the sea it could only go so far, and some kind of way you know to know better what to do with you than what God knows to do with you. Before he formed you in, his, in your mother's womb, he knew what he wanted to do with you. But somehow you know better. And so we get so stuck on what we can get for ourselves that we set the kingdom to the side. We're not sons because we don't take responsibility for our father's kingdom. We're just thinking about what we want. Most of us are prodigal because we want to take whatever God can get and then run off and do what we want. Bless me, give me, let me have. And then let me run off and do what I want to do. Give it to me, God, and leave me alone. But sons don't operate like that. Sons have the nature of their father. They take ownership of what is their father's. And their major concern, hallelujah, is not bringing shame to the family name. Right. See, some Christians don't think nothing about their name. You carry the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. You have married God. Mm -hmm. huh? You have married God. You are now, you now carry the name of Christ. You are the bride of Christ. Yes. You carry his name. That's what gives you spiritual authority. Yes. That's why you can pray and demons tremble. That's why you got that's how you got power over all the power of the enemy. It ain't in you. Huh? Paul and Barnabas stripped themselves because people thought that they were gods. They were preaching so good. Woo, I wish I could preach like that. They were preaching so good to the to the men starting to worship, and they said the gods have come down. Woo! These must be the gods. They look at Paul, he was a little fellow like me. They said, he's Mercury. He can move. Right? And then Barnabas was a big burly fellow like my dad. He, 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 man, he must be Jupiter. Look at your Bible for that. The gods have come down. Listen to how these men speak. And Paul said, oh, we ain't nothing, nothing like no God. Now. Look, look at his body. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't no God. I'm just a man. You see? Why? Because Paul wanted to stay right with God. Paul didn't want nobody thinking that he could do what God did. He said, he said, even Peter said, when the man was healed by his shadow, he said, don't look at me. Don't marvel like I have done this in my power. You see, the only reason Peter understood, he said, the only reason I got power is because I'm in Christ. Because I carry his name. His name means something. I'll never forget I was in the name. And at the time, I wasn't enjoying my time in the Navy. And when you don't enjoy yourself, if you ain't careful, you'll do sloppy work. Mm -hmm. And I came across, God had it just, just so, that I came across this chief. And this chief, we were just talking, I think he was Puerto Rican. And uh, I don't remember his name. But he said, uh, I was marveling at how excellent of a job he I said, man, you really do a good job. He's like, yeah. I said when I joined the Navy that I didn't want to do anything to shame my father's name. He pointed to the name tag. He said, this is my daddy's name. Wow. He said, I respect that name. He said, I will never do anything to bring shame to this name. Wow. Wow. And you carry your father's name. Yeah. And you've got to make up in your mind you're going to live such an excellent life that you will never again bring shame to your father's name. The number one way you bring shame to your father's name is by focusing on self. Being selfish. Self-centered. Because you can't you can't serve two masters, you see. If you serve self, you ain't serving your father. If you serve self, you ain't serving the king. That's why Jesus said, these words I speak, these miracles I do, they do not come from myself. He said, I only do 
Well, I see my father. You got to make up in your mind, you only going to do with your life what you see your father. Then you become a son. Now you're not motivated by reprimand no more. <laughs> Is that right? That's right. Retribution. You ain't worried about getting in trouble. Now you ain't, you ain't, you ain't motivated by just the reward that you can get. What can I get? Now you have taken responsibility. Huh? That's taboo now. Especially in the church. Remember, I want to take responsibility. That's somebody else's job. Let somebody else do that. Huh? But as long as it's somebody else, somebody else is going to get the blessing. Somebody else is going to be in right standing with God. And somebody else is going to enjoy the purpose that God has planned for their life and not you. Amen. Not you. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Amen. Willing and obedient. That sounds like responsibility to me. Somebody who's willing, who, 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 who don't have to wait for nobody to tell them. Don't have to be prompt and poked mm -hmm. to do the right thing. Right. Here's something. Don't have to wait for the Holy Ghost to convict them. Mm -hmm. See, too many Christians out here, they'll, they'll know they're wrong and won't get right until the Holy Ghost just make them cry. Mm -hmm. You got to cry to do right. You got to be overwhelmed with emotion before you do the right thing. Can't you just do right because it's right? Because it represents God. Yes. Because he wants to make you ruler of this world. And, and you want to be a righteous ruler. Don't you know what God is setting you up for? God is setting you up to rule. Yes. Yes. Oh, I might be going out too far. <laughs> <laughs> God, look, your little life is just a training ground. Right. For the rulership he's preparing you. I'm done. Let's say. Let's pray. Deliver us from a slave mentality. Help us push past just being a servant, standing by ourselves. And let us this day make up in our mind not just to be a child of God, but to be a son. To represent your nature. <clears throat> to carry your name <clears throat> in such a way that we honor you. To take ownership for kingdom things. To love people. To love people like you love them. To see past our own pettiness. And to move into your power. To move into your purpose. And lay hold on your promises. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're here and that means something to you, I want you to look up to your father. Right where you are. Right where you are. Yes. You're not going to do it all.